Hello and welcome to this Interact Center Europe webinar on our second call for project proposals. I'm Frank Schneider, Head of Communications and Public Policy and delighted to be your host today. Last week, we officially launched the second call at our program conference, together with nearly 800 participants in Vienna and online following our live stream. Already long before this, a preview of the call was published on our website, and I hope that many of you who are with us today have used the available information to start developing your proposal early on already. Together with the recommendations on key project features that we expect, we also published updated thematic tutorials and other support measures. There were also already a few national info days in some countries which you might have attended. So today, this will not be another core launch event. This webinar will not help you to decide whether to apply or not to apply. It is meant especially for all of you that have started to develop a proposal already and that got maybe stuck somewhere. We are therefore not giving any presentations, but we'll simply collect and answer as many of your questions as possible in the next two hours. We want to hear what you still find unclear in our call documents and where you expect additional support. Time is ticking fast. We will close the call on the 17th of May, which is already in seven weeks from now. So let's start right away and take a brief look at today's sessions. Today, we will start with the first round on the general framework of the program and the second call. Sorry, there's a typo in this, I see. And we will merge this with the thematic scope and relevance of project proposals. In a second round, we will look into the project work plan development before, last but not least, we will touch in the third round on project budget development and state aid. Before we now come to your questions, let me briefly remind you that we are recording this webinar and that we will upload it to our YouTube playlist as soon as possible. This will give you a chance to revisit all the answers given by my colleagues whenever you need them the most. As you can see in the Slido tool to your right, some of you already sent in questions in advance. You can post additional questions there at any time in the next two hours. And if you want to, you can also upvote other questions there, and we will give them a certain priority, of course. Last but not least, let me be, maybe point out a limitation. We might not be able to answer all your questions in the next two hours. If that happens, you can also send in your questions to uh, our help desk at helpdesk at interact-central.eu, and we will try to get back to you as soon as possible individually. Or if it is a more specific question, you can also discuss this with my colleagues very soon in an individual consultation. We will offer such individual consultations to all lead applicants as of tomorrow until the 10th of May on this community platform. So before we now start with the first round of your questions, I would have two questions for you. Let's look at the first one in the Slido tool. I would be very interested whether some of you and how many of you already follow the program conference. Let's have a look. So we are receiving some answers. Very few of you have not participated, it seems. So roughly 10% of you have answered. I will wait a little longer. We have more than 400 participants today. So let's wait until we have at least 100 replies here. We can see that the picture is changing a little. All right. So it's a little bit of mixed picture. Two thirds of you seem to have uh, followed the program conference either on site in Vienna or online here on this community, and one third has not. Those that have not followed the live stream, I really hope that you took the time to re-watch the conference, the core launch presentation, so that you could really develop your questions already for today. Let's have a uh, look at the second poll. I would be interested indeed how familiar you are with the key core related documents that we published. I'm talking here about the application package primarily. 
So are you familiar with all of them? Are you familiar with some of them? Or have you actually not yet read any of them, but maybe watch the tutorials to start with, browse through the website? Let's wait and see. I guess this is uh, to be expected since we only published the documents a week ago with the official core launch at our conference. Again, it seems that two thirds have read and looked into the core related documents already to a certain degree. Quite many of you actually know all of them. That's very good. And none of them, very few of you. So let's see what level the questions will also be, because obviously the more familiar you are with our core related documents, the more specific the questions can be for this webinar. And even more so, if you book an individual consultation slot, I think it would be crucial that you are very familiar with the core related documents before, because that's your time, your 45 minutes to really get answers to your very specific questions as of tomorrow. So today we will look into some more general questions. Thank you very, for your feedback so far. Let's now start with the first round without much further ado. In this first round, we will look into the general framework of the program and the second call, and we will take your questions on the thematic scope and relevance of project proposals. Here we have a few experts from the Secretariat joining me very soon. So we have Luca Ferrarese, the head of the Joint Secretariat. He will take the questions that uh, come from you on the general framework of the call of our program, etc. Then we have a few of our thematic experts with us. We have Chiara Casarella, who will answer questions on innovation and governance. We have Miriana Dominovic on energy and circular economy. Luba Jusko on environment and Winfried Ritt for questions related to mobility and transport. Let's have a look at one of the questions we received already in the past days. We have put this here as a kickoff question. The kickoff question that we received in the past days that we chose for this webinar is, have there been any changes of program requirements compared to the first call? I think, Luca, this is a great question for you to start. May I ask you to join me? Hello. Hi, good morning, everybody. Yes, indeed, I'm ready to answer. And so the, the answer to this question is that in, there were no changes of requirements as such. Uh, so the, pro, the call is completely open to all priorities, specific objectives. However, what changed was uh, a little bit some recommendations we give on project size and uh, meaning number of partners, duration and budget. Um, so changing from the first call, it means that we went from 36 to 30 months, recommended project duration, and uh, the budget size has been then adjusted accordingly in order to ensure that we have a good, uh, uh, let's say, coherence between the budget and the duration, because then the budget is around now from 1.2 to 1.9 million euro of European Regional Development Fund for projects. Other requirements didn't change really. Of course, anyway, there are changes in the call as such. There is less budget. Uh, this call has 60 million euro and the time for submission compared to call one is shorter because in the call one we had 100 days. Now we have 56 days, I think, from when we opened the call. I would say the other uh, aspects of the call remain the same. Thank you, Luca. I see another question that has been upvoted very many times, 10 times I see. So this question is, is it possible to have the consultations in the week of the deadline in order to present the most final version of the proposal. The background of this question for those that haven't really uh, read our documents yet, 
uh, consultations are uh, supposed to end on the 10th of May, and we close the call only on the 17th of May. So, Luca, why are we not uh, running consultations in this final week? Well, um, for a simple reason. The thing is that the, cons the aim of the consultation as such is not to check your proposal before you submit, but rather to give an address, a, an indication on an idea. We don't want to see your project proposal because we have to assess them afterwards. What we expect to do during the consultation is to give you some advice, consultation, on, uh, on the principles of your idea uh, in order to get already some hints on how you can uh, uh, maybe turn your idea in a better way in order to be more relevant for the program. And this obviously is, uh, is an early stage of the, uh, of the process for writing a proposal. And of course, that's why uh, it makes sense to have such a consultation quite in advance compared to when uh, uh, you are going, we are about to submit. Uh, I would like us to emphasize that consultations are any way to be done when you have a clear picture of what are the what is our program about, what are uh, our expectations with the second call. So you need to first read very well the documents to elaborate your idea. Then you come to a consultation. To come to a consultation just to learn what is written in the manual it would not be really uh, efficient for you and for us. So we recommend you to do it after you started uh, you had a good knowledge of the of the documents and you have a clear idea on what you want to do. I may also add that the consultation will start very soon after this Q&A, meaning from tomorrow. It will be the possibility to, to, to join us and to talk. To yes, us. indeed, Luca, and the consultations will be run on this platform. So you're registered already, those that are with us today. So it will be very easy to book the consultation. Um, big recommendation is, um, as you might imagine, we are expecting quite a number of applications. We have a limited number of experts in the JS. So book your consultation early on because slots are limited, obviously, and we will end them on the 10th of May. I see another question, maybe just a word on how the questions are uh, taken. You see also next to your questions, a little button saying whether this is a general call framework question, whether this is a budget related question. When you're upvoting a question, like the one on the Hungarian universities, as you can see here, no worries, we will answer this question, but it will be answered in a, in a later moment in this webinar. So stay with us if you're interested in this one. Seems we have many Hungarians with us, Luca, today, because this very specific national question has been upvoted so much. I have another question here, a project regarding the valorization and exploitation of cultural heritage. Uh, is it eligible in Central Europe? And if yes, under which priority and objective? This was actually also a question uh, at the core launch event uh, last week. Um, I think we did not take it. We didn't have the time. So this is the perfect moment. Luca, uh, can, you, can you let us know how do we deal with cultural topics? Yeah, uh, and probably and also where the quest, this question comes from, because in the previous program, we had a specific objective dedicated to cultural heritage, and now it's no longer there. Uh, this doesn't mean that culture is not important for us, but culture became an horizontal topic. Culture can be addressed in different uh, program-specific objectives, depending on the spin you want to give to your application. If you are uh, interested in maybe in cultural and creative industries, you might find your place under the specific objective 1.1, under innovation. Or culture can be framed in the context of environment, so you go into priority two. Or uh, culture, it could be a very interesting topic to be addressed under governance, which is the priority four of our program. So uh, let's say as such, we don't have the, the, let's say the pure culture dedicated uh, uh, priority or, or specific objective, but we have uh, the possibility to address this topic in various aspects under the other priorities. And indeed, I think also in the first call for proposals, there are some projects which are somehow addressing this matter. But I think it's this is how you have to address now, and it requires a little bit more 
better understanding of what we found. I really underline what I said also at the conference. Please read our interact program document, which is the basic document before reading the call, because there you find what we found and what kind of uh, topics we address under the priorities. Thank you, Luca. Uh, for those that are with us and not that familiar with our language yet, I always find it very confusing that it's called Interact Program Document because we are the Interact Program, right? So basically, uh, this is the strategic document laying out the, is, is the foundation of what we are doing. So indeed, Luca, as you say, it's really crucial to know the, uh, this document. Um, we also tend to call it just simply IP. So if you hear us talking about IP, it's not an intellectual property, but it's the Interact Program document. So I have another question. Um, I think it's again for you, Luca. Is the collaboration with projects from other EU programs desired? If yes, what can a cooperation look like? Like, shall it be associated partnership? Uh, shall there be a cooperation agreement? How shall this be dealt with? Yeah, maybe before answering this question, I just want to underline that it's not us very often inventing the name of these documents. We are taking from the regulations. So we would have better ideas, but we use the terminology coming from the bigger EU picture. Uh, coming back to the question, I would say, uh, of course, in, in, as a general approach in our program, we very much welcome synergies and complementarities with any other program, with any other, uh, let's say, initiative. Uh, we always say you don't have to reinvent the wheel. We always say that it's better to work together in order to get better results for your projects. So that's why uh, uh, we have a specific section in the in the application form, which is devoted ex exactly to this, to explain how your project can make use of synergies with other EU and uh, 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 projects or initiatives. And this is there where you can explain uh, uh, to which initiatives you you can uh, you can create synergies and how this is not only there you can also uh, touch on this topic during in the description of the work plan but my colleagues will talk about the work plan later on and they know much more than me um, in the in which form the, we don't have any predefined form for this call they can let's say. Uh, project holders from an Horizon pro project, for example, could be associated partners, but they could be also project partners in this proposal. In, in our proposal, if they are eligible, uh, we don't expect to have any specific agreement. But of course, it's part of the description of the work plan how you want to make use of synergies. So you are completely free to describe in a best and more convincing way. Uh, how your project builds on past experiences and how your project join forces with other initiatives for a better result. And of course, if you are able to explain it, of course, the project will look better. It will make more sense. But as I said, this is not a requirement. It's really up to how your project is designed, how your project is, is framed in the bigger picture in Central Europe. Thank you, Luca. We have nearly 60 questions to cover. So let's see how many we managed today. First 20 minutes are gone already. So we have another one on the partnership. Um, interesting one. Can we have a project partner from Iceland? Um, of course, taking into account the minimum requirements of having two partners uh, from the program area. Well, um, the thing is that we have a full chapter devoted in the program manual for, for partnership to keep it very short. Uh, the thing is that we are funding only EU partners. We are able to give funds only to, uh, to partners located in, in, in regions of the, uh, of the European, of the member states in the EU. Uh, this means that this partner might join as an associated partner, but is not receiving funding from us. Uh, I saw there was another question on associated partners. Maybe, Frank, I can take up immediately also this one. Basically, an associated partner can be uh, uh, from wherever. They have to, they, there are no specific requirements. They are not receiving direct funding from us, but they can still participate in project activities. And the actual project partners in the project 
can also support travel and accommodation of these partners and, and you know, um, taking care of this kind of networking activities that might be beneficial for the project by involving the associated partners. So an option could be to have these partners uh, from outside the EU as associated partners. Thank you, Luca. A question uh, from a tourism marketing and communication agency based in Cagliari. Um, they would like to cooperate as partners for proposals. How can they apply? Um, I mean, Cagliari is a beautiful place. I know it pretty well, but unfortunately, it's not Central Europe area. So the participation of a partner from outside the Central Europe area has to be duly justified. So they can participate in proposals, but please refer to uh, the chapter on geographical flexibility in our program manual, in which it is explained that partners from outside the program area might be involved as a partner in the partnership, so applying for funding as soon as there is a, a, a clear benefit for the Central Europe area as such. Thank you, Luca. Um, this is actually true for, for any uh, partner, potential partner from a region uh, that is outside the 81 uh, regions of our program area. You will find a list of all the regions that are um, uh, in our program area also on our website. Um, so if you go there, you will see a full list of 81 regions um, that find it will find it easier to cooperate within our program. More questions for you, Luca. I'm not sure we have any thematic scope questions coming. Um, I see there might be one question after this. So one more question for you, and then we can give you a break, Luca, maybe. So the 17th of May, um, is it a deadline for PIF? Or for a full application. We are not the only ones using acronyms that are very difficult to understand for some people. So it must be something probably like an EOI to throw in another <laughs> acronym. So I know that acronym. It's you know, so please form. enlighten us, Luca, enlighten me. No, I know the acronym. So it's project idea form is a short version. It's like a concept note. Uh, no, we have a call which is in one step, meaning that you have to, full, to submit the full package. And the reason for that is that we are wishing to keep the time for, for application as short as possible. So we want to go straight with full applications and then we perform the full assessment and then we come to a funding decision. So the full application has to be submitted, not only the project idea. Sorry, now we have a thematic question. Thank you so much, Luca. Let's see. Now it disappeared. Yeah. Let's wait a little. Um, I need another question on. Otherwise, it, it, otherwise, um, so I see that the that the curiosity is growing on these Hungarian universities. We were planning to answer this a lot later, but maybe I can call in my colleague Helga Portelli uh, already because um, I don't want to hold back for the Hungarian uh, viewers today much longer. So let's cover this question maybe straight away. Hello, Helga. Thank you for joining spontaneously in this part of the web webinar already. Good morning, Frank. And yes, Thank I've seen that this uh, question has really um is interesting to many uh, so just to put the mind at rest of our hungarian partners and also of our other uh, applicants uh just to to refer that this probably this question comes up after there was a council implementing decision taken in 2022 in december 22 whereby some hungarian institutions are excluded are excluded from funding However, uh, I would like to put again the, the minds at rest of the Hungarian partners. This uh, decision, this implementing decision, does not uh, have an impact on participation to interreg programs. So Hungarian partners can form part of the partnership in an interreg CE project. Thank you, Helga. 
So I hope this answered the question. So come and join us. Um, I think it's really important to say, though, we are, I, I mean, in case uh, you want to compensate for not being able uh, to work uh, in the Horizon program, we are not a research program. Uh, we are quite different, so we are not really able to substitute uh, for that funding uh, for the Hungarian universities. Um, this is very crucial to keep in mind. Maybe if you have any further questions on this, um, I strongly recommend to get in touch also with our national contact point in Hungary. Uh, you will find the contact details again on our website. So. I hear that we will come back to this uh, question about um, uh, the thematic scope in a short while. So, Luca, I have maybe one more question for you. So, ah, actually, no, sorry, Luca, this is a finance question. It's, um, I think, probably because we saw Hager, we are now pushing the finance questions a little bit. So, um, let me see what could be the next question. Do we have anything still on the general framework? I'm going through it. Seems we have covered most of these questions. The question, if I remember right, which was on the thematic scope, was a question addressing Chiara. You will not see it in the slide or two to the right uh, at this moment, but maybe Chiara, we can take this one. Hello, welcome Chiara. Um, Thank you. The, Hi. the question, if I remember correctly, and but you will for sure um, remember, uh, I think it was if you want to uh, bring in a proposal for a specific objective 1.2, uh, do we need to have an SME, uh, a smaller or medium enterprise partner included in the consortium? Now I see it's also back in, um, in Slido. So Chiara, the floor is yours. Hello. Hello, thank you, Frank. Uh, thank you for this question. Um, I would say that generally speaking, it really depends how you build your project. So that is to say it is not a must that a project addressing SMEs need to have SMEs as project partners. So if a given SMEs as a specific reason to be in the consortium as contributing partner, like all the other partners that are there, then of course it can be part of it, you know? So this is in general terms for the program is crucial that the project clearly shows who does what in the consortium. So if that specific SME is meaningful, then yes, of course they can be in. Um, otherwise SMEs for projects addressing SMEs, SMEs can also be a target group or stakeholders. Um, <clears throat> but it is not a must uh, that they are fully um, engaged project partners. And in the past, um, just to say that we have had projects that were working a lot with SMEs, uh, but that did not necessarily have a particular SME in uh, as a fully fledged project partner. So I hope that this uh, answer helps. And once again, I think if there is a specific, if there are more specific questions and if there is uh, anything more in detail, then of course the applicants can come to the consultation. Thank you, Chiara. Thank you also for pointing out the individual consultations again. Um, before we move on into the work plan uh, development, um, I can see that we have one more question uh, on thematic scope. Thank you, Chiara. And with this, um, I, I think um, this is a question for Miriana, I think. Considering the priority two theme, hello, Miriana. Hello, Frank, hi. Considering the priority two theme, I ask if a project on the construction of non-profit energy communities and the involvement of citizens is an applicable topic theme. Um, we have it also in our IP uh, indicated on the energy communities. So it's in general, the topic as such is uh, very welcomed. Um, but as uh, my colleague Chiara said, I would advise to go to the consultations to book uh, on time the slot for the consultations, describe the 
the idea and then to discuss uh, with us uh, more on this. Of course, we are all always welcomed for the new ideas and uh, new combinations that partners are very often um, sending to us. Thank you, Mirjana, for this one. And with this, um, I think we are coming to an end of this session. So a big thank, uh, thank you to Luca. Big thank you to my colleagues uh, on thematic uh, questions. We did not have that many, but I'm pretty sure we will. you will hear more when we get to the individual consultations. And with this, I think it is time to move on to the next question round. And in this second round, we will be discussing the project work plan development with you. We have um, already quite many questions I could see, and these will be answered by the two co-heads of the project management unit, Monika Schöner-Klee-Grasser and Christoph Ebermann. Let's have a look at the very first question that we received recently. So the first question for this session is, are there any particular recommendations for applicants based on experiences from the first call? For example, frequent shortcomings you saw that should be avoided. And Monica, maybe I can ask you to join me to answer this question. Hello, good morning. Good morning, Frank. Um, yes. Thank you very much for this question. I think it's a very relevant to see also how um, the situation was in the first call. And I must say we had actually pretty good applications in frequent shortcomings, which were there, were actually due to the fact that quite some proposals, they did not really that clearly show um, their territorial dimension. So sometimes it was maybe also some more research-oriented projects, which were more um, concentrating on, let's say, more theoretical results or scientific results, or really it was not so much clear how these results would really benefit the regions which are involved in our program, and in particular, the ones which are participating in the projects. And another issue which we um, identified as shortcomings was that um, the transnational dimension was maybe not that fully clear or not that um, given um, that much importance. So this means that some of the pro project proposals, they could have also been implemented maybe just at the regional level alone or at the national level, so not really demonstrating how this transnational cooperation, which is key to our program, is um, being implemented. And last but not least, what we saw is that um, some proposals, which didn't make it actually then, of course, they were not that clear and rather blurry or vague. So, and this in particular concerned pilot actions, for instance, where they were a bit like a black box and it was not really clear what would be the actual scope and how they would be implemented. And maybe this was an issue of maturity or even leaving this up to the very last minute. But what is important is that um, a project proposal really presents already the clear idea that you see it really in your mind, what is the outcome and what is to be implemented during the project lifetime. Thank you, Monica. This is super helpful, I think. I have another question on the work plan. I have many questions on the work plan, so a few for you, and then we might call in Christoph. Uh, every partner in the project must have a pilot action, or can we have one pilot action in which we will we'll include at least two partners from at least two participating countries in the project? Yeah, thank you very much. I think that's a very interesting question because pilot actions, they are at the core. They really give the opportunity to try out something very new in the frame of the project. And what is important and even more important now in this period is the joint um, development and implementation of pilot actions. And this also means that um, 
a pilot action should not be just a pilot action of one partner, but it should be a joint one. And the answer to this question is then um, that not necessarily each um, pilot action has to be, that each partner has to be involved in each pilot action or has to have an own pilot action, but pilot actions are actually to be defined at project level. They have, of course, to be coordinated by one of the partners, but it's really up to the project scope what um, wants to be done. So a project maybe of, I don't know, 10 partners could have four pilot actions. So this means really to concentrate on some new whatever methods, some new solutions to be developed, to be jointly um, tested, and then um, to be implemented by at least two or three partners. Thank you, Monica. We have certain outputs defined, and it seems that one output here uh, is especially um, yeah, raising questions, and that's the output of corporations. How should applicants understand this output? Um, cooperation is key. As I mentioned before, it's central. It's, it's, it's really the crucial element. Um, this output and also the respective indicator is a very technical one. It's an um, indicator or an output type which comes from the regulation and which covers only the number of project partners plus the associated partners. And this output and indicator, um, both in terms of output indicator and result indicator, is mandatory to all projects. So there is no way out of not choosing this indicator, and it has to be chosen um, only once for the first work, work package. And this is in addition to any other outputs or output indicators. So as I said before, it's a very technical one, and it has, and this output indicator, which is linked to the corporations, it can be regarded already also as achieved when signing um, the subsidy contract and the partnership agreement. So when the cooperation as such is established. So it's very technical, but it's also very central, as we say, cooperation is central. So thank you, Monica, for explaining this. Um, the difference between outputs and deliverables is also not so clear for everyone uh, with us today. So how would you see, how would you explain uh, a bit further than in our program manual what the difference is between these two? Thank you very much for this question. I think there have been several maybe misunderstandings or questions also in the past about this terminology. Um, you have all the definitions um, of um, these terms in our glossary and also in the manual, but just to explain it in a nutshell. As an output, it is to be regarded what is really the main achievement of the project and of a particular work package. And as Frank said, we have different output types in our um, program. So this is um, the cooperation, which we mentioned before. These are the strategies and action plans. Then we have pilot actions and we have solutions. So just a couple of output types. And this is what is the outcome? What is really the, uh, the achievement at the end of the project? And um, in comparison, deliverables, they are products. They are actually the documentation, how these outputs have been achieved. So a deliverable is somehow a report or a data set or a, a document or an investment documentation or the documentation of a pilot action. So it's something um, which you can physically grasp and which you can also, as the term also says, deliver to the program in terms of reporting. And there can be somehow intermediate deliverables, but what is also important is that each output is then finally covered by a final deliverable, which um, presents the overall output as such. Thank you, Monica. The next question, maybe we give you a short break. We ask Christoph to join us. Thank you, Monica, for this so far. We will for sure see each other in a few minutes again. Hello, Christoph. Good morning. Hello, good morning. Good 
morning, Frank. Good morning. So I have one more question straight away for you. Who and under what conditions can participate in the project as an associated partner? What should be the role of this entity? And can the participation of such an organization be financed under the project, e.g. participation in expert meetings, presentations of pilot solutions? Partly this was already, I think, answered by Luca before, but uh, maybe we can go a bit more into uh, depth here. Yes, indeed. I think it's a good idea to look back into this question because I've seen also in Slido there are also other questions related to it, uh, to associated partners. So associated partners are institutions willing to be involved in the project, but without directly financially contributing to it. So these are institutions which usually are uh, key stakeholders uh, for the implementation of the project. For example, they can help the to the uptake of outputs, they can contribute to the rollout of outputs and results of the project, and this have a sort of a multiplier uh, effect uh, for the project. Um, information on the uh, associated partners is required to be filled in in the application form, and notably there, you should uh, specify uh, in which role these associated partners will be involved and what is the added value for the project. Um, because I saw the question in Slido later on, whether in this call we are having uh, any uh, support letters or any other documents to be provided for associated partners, I take this one straight away as well, which is no, we have not changed this, so there are no documents to be uploaded for the associated partners. Thank you, Christoph. Let's have a look into the next question. Most of them are coming from anonymous, some by names. Uh, don't be afraid to, to uh, put your name or so. I don't think there's any uh, wrong questions, any uh, stupid questions. And um, it's always nice to see who is asking the question or so. So anonymous, we want to apply and we plan some research and development activities. What do you finance? What? And when uh, our ideas will our ideas fit with more, which more specific objectives? Yeah, I think this is also a very good question, um, and it is also related to one of the shortcomings which we saw in the first call, which Monica was just mentioning. Um, we are a territorial cooperation program. Uh, we are not an R and D program, so we are not financing pure R&D projects. I think this is really an important message and we have seen in the previous call some projects which stayed only at the level of R&D activities, which is not fitting into what we are looking for in terms of projects. So uh, for us, projects can have uh, some research and development components, but then the important part is the implementation at territorial level so that you we go into action in the territories and um, and there is no limitation with this for different specific objectives this is a general approach for all specific objectives thank you christoph um not only but uh, surely also a strong strong message um, for those that were asking from hungarian universities but this applies to any university any research institute uh, you have to bring it to the ground so is it generally generally desirable for a project to have as many outputs as possible? Should each output be linked to its own result? And can several outputs contribute to the same result? Yeah, I think um, the more is not the better. Um, it's about quality. And so there is not a general answer how many outputs a project should have. Um, the outputs should relate to what your project is about to do, what is its intervention logic, and, and this is really the important point, what is the change your project wants to achieve? So in terms of territorial change and its result. So uh, what you can see uh, is, the, as pointed out by Monica before, we have um, uh, three main output types. Um, and if you go into the Annex 2 of the program manual, which is a very important document for uh, all applicants to look at, we have a definition of how these outputs are to be understood. And you will see that for all these outputs, a joint development is needed for pilot action. It's actually joint development and implementation, which means that by definition, you need to have at least institutions involved from two countries 
in working on the single output, which thereby limits your total number of outputs compared to what we might have seen in the previous programming period in 1420, uh, where the number of outputs was higher than the number of outputs we are seeing in current uh, applications and projects supported for the 2127 program. Thank you, Christoph. There's one more and then I will give you a break and maybe call back Monica because we have many more questions, I understand, on the work plan development. So last question for you, Christoph, uh, at this moment, if relevance and experience for successful implementation re is required, is it possible to have several partners with different profiles and roles from, let's say, one city or country um, participating as consortium members in the same project? Um, not neglecting, obviously, the geographical diversification uh, overall uh, on partnership level. Well, I think the, the direct answer is the partnership has to fit to what the project intends to implement. Um, so it really depends on uh, which types of partners and expertise do you need on board in terms of expertise for being able to conduct the activities and competence in order to really have uh, the territorial competences to, 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 to conduct the activities on the ground. Uh, if I take the example of uh, if your project is dealing with urban rural relationships and corporations, it could make sense that for, uh, for one country you involve uh, the core city and then the region in which the city is located in order to work on the governance between the city and the region. On the other hand, in another project, it could make sense that you have the city and an energy agency, for example, cooperating, or you can have a, a, a local authority and a NGO or a research institution from the country. So it really depends on what your project intends to do and that you also keep in mind we are a cooperation program. So the goal is, of course, to have a, a balanced uh, distribution uh, of the, within the partnership uh, from partners coming from different countries. So the goal cannot be that uh, from one country you have four, five, six partners, and while the other countries are only represented by one partner, but the cooperation should be very well visible in your co partnership structure. But then, of course, um, depending on the scope of your project, it makes sense to have uh, different governance levels addressed within a country or to have also a multi-sectoral approach within the country. Thank you, Christoph. Um, thank you very much so far. Um, I think I can give you a break and Monica will be ready to answer a few more questions. Hello, Monica. Welcome back. I have a First question from you from Andras Talos um, 10 minutes ago. So it's a fresh question. Um, it's about the joint actions. Um, does it mean that the plan or method is jointly developed, but the actual physical works and investments uh, could belong, of course, to one of the partners alone? It's kind of like uh, continuing what Christoph said, the joint development. Uh, so how, how, how do we really uh, see this? I understand that this question is linked to mostly pilot actions and some of pi our pilot actions, they can have some pilot investments for sure. And as mentioned before, this um, joint implementation is a crucial element, but since pilot actions in nearly all cases and even more pilot investments, they have a physical nature, they need to have also a physical location. And um, therefore, of course, the ownership is also a crucial one, considering I don't know that there could be the physical construction of whatever for a pilot site. And this ownership belongs to one of the partners um, who belong, who, who owns this site. And therefore, of course, this um this this ownership is has to be um within the partnership, has to be to one of the partners, and this is also a crucial element for maintaining then actually the pilot investment for the durability of the of the investment even after the project lifetime which is also an obligation thank you monica 
Uh, next question, under what conditions can works and infrastructures, uh, infrastructure costs be eligible? Is it possible um, to build a smaller building as part of valorization and exploitation of a touristic destination? We're not talking about accommodation, it seems only an entry point. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think in this aspect, it's important to highlight that we are not an investment program. So we finance some smaller investments, which are linked to pilot actions, therefore also to be seen as pilot investments. And those have to be something experimental. They can be something smaller scale. They have to have either a pilot or demonstration character. So if I read this question, I don't know really what um, this, uh, the project scope would be about. But it could belong, this pilot investment could be belong to a smaller part, um, which is needed to test a different approach or test a different method. And this needs to be complying, of course, also with project objectives and needs to be necessary for reaching the project objectives. So it's not just to buy something which is maybe useful for one partner or which is um, part of a, of a bigger building, if I understand this right. But this pilot investment must really have um, a clear experimental character and also be of benefit then in order to share knowledge um, with other partners. Thank you, Monica. Even though you emphasize that we are not an investment program, there's still quite a few questions on investments because investments are possible, of course, nevertheless. So the question here, if any permits necessary for the implementation of a project um, are needed, is it mandatory to have them already in the application phase or is it good enough to make sure that you have them as a project partner when the project mm -hmm. is selected for funding? Yeah. Um, I would say it's not completely mandatory to have them already in the application form, but um, in the application phase and to, to be able to prove this already um, when you write your application form. But of course, it's an important element to have this early enough to be really able to implement the investment also in time. And I think experience has also shown that we had some cases where projects really were struggling with getting permits um, then later on during the project lifetime. And this was a big risk for the whole project and then delayed the overall implementation of the project. So this means if you know already now that you need some permits, please start early enough with applying for it and also to give a clear outline also about the expected duration and possible risks or how the process would be already within the section where you describe the investment um, implementation. Thank you, Monica. There's a question by Daria Zikorska. In the previous call, mm -hmm. there was no place to put detailed information of the implementations and the story behind the investments. What is the possibility to broadly describe the study sites? Um, can there be appendices to the application form? Um, there is no change of the application form compared to call one. Um, I would say nevertheless, in this investment section, there is enough space that you describe the investment. For instance, there is a, a quite an extensive text box on the description of the um, as, um, investment, its pilot character, and also the transnational relevance. So I think um, if you provide um, the main um, cornerstones of the investment, which are crucial in order to assess um, whether this investment is really needed and whether it is realistically to be implemented, this would fit very well into this investment section of the application form. Thank you, But Monica. I would advise you yeah. to really concentrate what are the crucial um, aspects of the investment, and there is no need for lengthy whatever explanations, telling background information. Please really concentrate on what are the main um, characteristics of the assessment of the, sorry, of the investment and what are the benefits for the overall project and also the, the other partners. 
Thank you, Monica. Unfortunately, it is a lot harder to uh, stay focused and uh, write short um, texts, as we all know. There's this old saying, um, I think by Mark Twain, saying, I had no time uh, to write a short letter, so I wrote a long one. <laughs> so it's not like this in the application forms. You will have to try. There are certain limitations, um, obviously, but we also believe that then uh, in these few words, you hopefully will be able to tell the story of an investment. So Monica, there's two or three more questions, I understand, but for this, I could call Christoph back and give you a break once again uh, on work plan development. Welcome back, Christoph. Let's start straight away with uh, one of the final questions for this round. Does the project leader's lack of experience in managing Interreg or Horizon projects have a significant impact on the evaluation process? Do they stand a chance if they have never been with us? Well, thank you. Well, thank you for this question, Frank. Um, before directly answering it, I'd like uh, to point out to one element uh, because uh, we have been discussing now a lot on the application form, how it looks, where to fill in information. This is also a question on how to present information in the application form. And here I really would like to point to the application form offline template, including guidance. So as part of the application package available, uh, we have also an offline template with guidance included. So where you have for almost all the text boxes of the application form, a guidance text box, which describes uh, which elements are to be highlighted, or it's also based a bit on lessons learned, what we saw from, uh, from the call one. So please have also a look at this application form, including guidance. But nevertheless, of course, uh, the submission and the filling in of the application form which you want to submit, this is only done in GEMS. So this is an important element to, to highlight. Um, coming back to this question, well, one of the text boxes in the partnership you uh, uh, applicants are, uh, are filling in is um, describing the expertise and experience of uh, the partners in order to fulfill the roles they have in their project. For the lead partner, of course, uh, it would be beneficial if the partner can demonstrate that it has experience in managing either interact projects, other EU-funded projects, or, or Horizon projects, for example, because um, working at transnational or international level is always a challenge. And maybe if you're completely new to the interact world um, or the international cooperation world, maybe it could be a, an opportunity to start as a partner, to get to know the processes and only then to move into a lead partner role. However, if you think that you want to be a lead partner and you don't have the direct experience, you can also describe in this uh, text box how you want to organize your capacities in order to be able to fulfill this role, which can be, for, for example, by recruiting uh, external support with external project managers, uh, which have expertise in managing international cooperation projects. So this is something you can describe in there. Um, but again, um, this is how you present the information and you have to convincingly demonstrate in your application how you as a partner are going to fulfill the role you're foreseeing for yourself in the project. This is applicable actually for the lead partner, but we also have a communication leader in the project usually. So also this role should be described in the respective text box. Same for the other roles of the other partners where you have implementation roles or knowledge provider roles, etc. Indeed, thank you very much, Christoph, for pointing out also the important role of the communication manager and the experience here, because we ran a survey among projects uh, in the last programming period. And one of the success factors for communicating a project successfully identified by the projects was indeed to have an experienced um, communication manager in the project. So on the work plan development, one more question uh, by Gabriela Zimo. Is there a sustainability obligation for Central Europe projects following project implementation? And if yes, how many years would that be? Um, answer is of course, yes, but Christoph, the floor is yours. I'd like to turn around this question actually um, and come to an essential part of your application, which is um, the relevance of your application and that your application has to respond to a territorial need you want to address. So in this sense, you have to convincingly 
demonstrate in your application that through cooperation, you want to solve a territorial challenge in your region by developing and testing, for example, new approaches, which lead to new solutions. Of course, if you're working for three years, for example, or two and a half years in a cooperation project, which you're going to be uh, supported, the goal is that the solution or the new strategy is being taken up by your organizations. So I think you should not think from the end, what are the regulatory requirements uh, in order to outputs for sustain to be sustained? The answer should rather be, how can we make sure that the outputs which are being developed in the frame of the project are being sustained, are being mainstreamed? And this is exactly what you should um, present in the frame of re your results and covered by the result indicators, where exactly you need to demonstrate uh, for example, if you have a strategy, um, whether it will be taken up by the uh, organizations and institutions competent for this uh, strategy within your project. So do you have your result indicators, which are matching the related outputs of your project, uh, which are related to the uptake and um, the continuation of the activities uh, conducted in the frame of the project. And yes, this needs to be demonstrated there. And this is a part of the assessment where we look into how durable actually uh, uh, are your activities and your results and how durable is this change going to be at territorial level. Absolutely. Thank you very much, Christoph. In the end, we want to change something or this should be the aim of the project. So how can you do it? Um, if anything stops uh, after three years. So another question by Alenka. Um, in case the project is resubmitting its proposal, is it beneficial to keep the title an acronym or is this not relevant? Well, I think the, I cannot really give a, 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 a not one answer that fits all. It depends if the project was considered not relevant then maybe you should reflect on the project idea. And when you reflect on the project idea, maybe you also want to change uh, the, the focus of the project, which should be reflected also in the title. Um, if your project was nearly perfect and you only had uh, uh, some issues, for example, in terms of uh, shortcomings in terms of work plan or budget or other elements, maybe then you can stay in the frame which and the focus which you had set in the first call. So, but this is, there is not one answer fits all. I think what is important is that applicants look into the recommendations which are defined in the terms of reference uh, in terms of uh, project duration, uh, project budget, revisit the feedback they have received in the frame of call one proposals uh, if they were rejected. And um, as also introduced by Luca at the beginning of the session, I think it's uh, very important that uh, if applicants are resubmitting a proposal, they should come early in uh, the consultation process to our colleagues at the JS in order to discuss um, if they want to re come again with the same idea, what, whether the idea is fitting or in which fields um, there can be uh, improvements. But again, it is important that consultations are conducted only on the base of the project idea submitted and not on application forms uh, or other documents. So I think this is also to be highlighted. Thank you, Christoph. I have a last one for you. And then we will move on into the third and last round because I believe many people also have finance related questions. So a uh, last one on the work plan is a project that focuses on the best practices in a specific topic and their alignment or comparison between the countries suitable for this program and this call. Well, again, this it's difficult to really position an idea just from one sentence. Um, if I read the idea as it is put here, as a, my first thought would be, this is a more research oriented project because it is about making some comparisons, producing some papers, and that's it. And we are an implementation oriented program. So what I'm missing is, is the goal to implement 
best practices in a given field and le leading to a territorial change in some regions. So again, always the starting point is, what is the problem in a territory? How do you want to address it? Which objectives are you following it? And what is the change situation at the end? Just working on identifying best practices and comparing situations would not be enough in this sense. However, if this is a working tool as part of the process in order to identify a solution in order to change the situation in a given field in a given territory, then it could be possibly fitting. So I think this is something maybe to be further investigated and to be discussed also with the colleagues in the consultations. Thank you, Christoph. Um, there's also a very nice, short and crisp tutorial which you prepared together with us on the intervention logic. Uh, this could also help to understand the process, uh, how a uh, project proposal can be developed and what we are expecting. So thank you very much so far. Thank you very much also, Monica, for uh, contributing to this session. You have to imagine virtual applause now, because unfortunately, we will not hear from the audience. So thank you. Thank you for joining. And with this, I would suggest we move on for the last 45, 50 minutes into the last round. And here, we will look into project budget development and state aid. We have two new experts for this session. First of all, you have met her already this morning, Helga Potelli, the head of the program management unit, and she will be joined, especially for state aid questions, by her deputy, Christina Grumach. So let's have a look into the first question in this section. Again, this is a question we received the day before this webinar or in the days before this webinar. I was almost asking this question to Luca, but I think Helga will be a much better um, person to answer this question. And the question is, post-pandemic meetings versus virtual meetings, how should travel expenses be calculated? Helga, may I ask you to join me here on this virtual stage? Good morning again. Hello. Good morning again, Frank. Yes, I've seen that also this, um, this question has quite a lot of interest. And maybe I would like to start by saying that uh, we have introduced a number of simplifications in this programming period. And uh, we have also introduced a number of simplified cost options. And with regards to this, with travel and accommodation costs, uh, these are calculated on a flat rate basis. The flat rate is calculated on the basis of direct staff costs, and the percentage depends on where the uh, beneficiary is located. So, for example, if a beneficiary is located in, let's say, Austria, there is a particular percentage, let's say 5%. If it is uh, in, in another country, then it would be uh, a different percentage. These percentages are listed in our um, implementation uh, manual. So please do refer to the definitions of each cost category and what is included uh, in them. Thank you, Helga. The next question about budget uh, development is, can you give a few examples of what the investment cost category includes? Uh, first of all, I would like to clarify that there is no cost category, which is called investments. Uh, investments, uh, we uh, see them as uh, into kind of two different cost categories. We have the cost category five, which is equipment, and then the cost category six, which is infrastructure and works. And here again, I would like to refer to the program manual where for each cost category, there is a list of what uh, it includes. What is the definition of each cost category and what kind of costs uh, are eligible under these cost categories? If we take, for example, cost category five, there are uh, invest parts of the investment could be, for example, IT, hardware and software, lab equipment, tools, and so on and so forth. 
Uh, as for the cost category six, which is infrastructure and works, there we have, for example, the cost of building permits or building materials uh, and also labor. So these are uh, some examples of what kind of costs can be included under these two cost categories, which uh, an investment should uh, be regarded, you know, you, you need to see them uh, related to these two cost categories, cost category five, equipment, and cost category six, infrastructure and works. Thank you, Haiga. Um, can the project partner, as part of the 20% own contribution, bring specialized equipment and materials that are necessary to perform the demonstration in a pilot area? Okay. Um, what needs to be understood that for every cost, everything needs to be pre-financed by the institution. So first, the way we the way the, the financial flows work are that uh, the institution has to um, pay the hundred percent. And then it is reported to us, and then the beneficiaries receive 80% in ERDF funding. So the idea of bringing in uh, the 20% as um, kind of in kind, uh, this is, does not really function in the way we, we, um, we have the financial flows. I mentioned the word in-kind, and I would like to also uh, point out that in-kind contributions are not eligible in, in our program. So uh, these are also listed. What is, what is not eligible is also listed in our program manual under the relevant um, chapter there. Thank you, Helga. Are there possibilities for shared cost agreements within the partnership? I actually just made reference to this uh, non-eligible expenditure chapter in our uh, program manual, which is chapter 1.4.2.3. And shared costs is also one of those non-eligible expenditures. So the splitting of costs among partners is not um, eligible in, in, in our program. Uh, one has to uh, remember that we are in the spirit of cooperation, and so it is not a matter of splitting costs, but rather splitting uh, the activities and, and the functions among the, the, the partnership. Thank you, Helga. Um, the next question, how important is it to prepare a balanced budget among partners and regions? Should the amount of partner budgets be close to each other, or is it also acceptable that some partners have less tasks, therefore less budget um, on the balance among tasks? If yeah, or is the balance in general preferred also in terms of activities, in terms of what they do? Exactly. So uh, balance is the key word here, and one has to think that when preparing a budget, the budget has to be a realistic budget. So it is not a matter of having, I don't know, a project of 2 million uh, euros and then there are 10 partners and you just divide between the 10 partners and there you go, voila, you have the budget. It is not like that. A budget has to be realistic. So of course, it is understandable that uh, certain partners would have a higher budget than others because the budget reflects the tasks. So if there are certain parts, it's not only the tasks. I mean, it's also, uh, we know that even costs uh, vary from one uh, member state to the other. Some costs are, maybe staff costs are more, more expensive in, in, um, in Germany than they are in, for example, Slovenia. So keep in mind that a budget should be realistic based on what is uh, foreseen in the application form. Thank you for this. There's still the importance on top. Here's a new question for you, Helga. Does this does the Central Europe program recommend using simplified cost options more or less when building the budget? How do you score us then? Is there a difference if you choose SEOs over real cost? Absolutely not. I mean, it is up to the beneficiaries themselves to decide which simplified cost options they should apply. There are some simplified cost options which are mandatory. Let's say if you go for the budget on a real cost basis, then 
uh, the cost category two, which is administrative costs, is it's obligatory that you have the flat rate. And it is the same for travel and accommodation. So the flat rate, there is no possibility to go for a real cost rather than the, the, the flat rate as a simplified cost option. So for some, it is uh, obligatory. For others, let's say we take the 40% uh, simplified cost option, which is uh, um, uh, practically all the cost categories from cost category two to six calculated on the direct staff costs. This is up to each beneficiary to see uh, which is the best option for them, whether to go for real costs or for a simplified cost option. And when we are um, assessing the project, we assess the project accordingly to see how, whether this is um, uh, value for money or not, but we do not, if, if someone would have chosen the 40%, we would not put, you know, give them a less, uh, decrease their score just because they use simplified cost options. Yeah, I guess uh, in that case, it would not make sense to even introduce it. Exactly. And we would not have it. introduced and then put it down for, for this. No, we, we introduce simplified cost options because we believe in simplified cost options and we believe in simplification. Makes it easier for everyone. So which kind of organizations are entitled to co-financing from the state? Okay, this is a very particular, it's not at a, uh, this question is not at a program level. So as you know, we do the co-financing, we have the ERDF co-financing, which is 80%, and you need to bring in your own 20%. Uh, there are some member states that uh, give um, the co-financing, but this has to be seen at national level. So I really recommend you to get in touch with your national contact points to see what are the possibilities from a national perspective. Thank you, Helga. Uh, next question is about income. Interesting one. Is it possible to generate any income? It is possible and there are no limitations for income generating uh, gen for income generated through project activities. So the regulations do not stipulate anything about revenues. We were just uh, discussing here, Helga, to give you a short break maybe and uh, focus on state aid briefly and call in Christina. Hello, Christina. Hello, Thank Frank. You. Good morning, greetings to everyone. So we have a few state aid questions for you and Hega can take a short break. Uh, there's so many finance questions as you might imagine. So may, uh, first one on state aid. May partners receiving state aid under the general block exemption uh, regulation uh, increase their budget under budget flexibility requirements? Yes, this is possible. Um, both minor and major uh, budget uh, modifications are possible up to the limit, which is in the current uh, um, version of GBER, 2 million euros per partner, which is much, much higher than usual partner budget in our projects. Thank you, Christina. So we have another one in case an organization in if webinars are organized specifically devoted to improve capacities of companies, are they to be considered as indirect state aid, even if they will be made available to all interested companies through an online platform? Uh, thank you for the question. So um, in general, it, term, it uh, is related to indirect aid, aid uh, that is provided uh, by the project partners or project lead partner to third parties, usually final beneficiaries of activities. In this very specific question, it is important to see the conditions under which uh, activity of webinar that um, is intended to improve capacities of certain companies is implemented. Uh, namely, if there is selective advantage given to certain undertakings, certain companies, then indirect aid exists. However, there are also conditions under which this state aid cause could be eliminated. And this is recognized once we do the assessment for the state aid risk 
in case that there is possibility to remove state aid risk, in this case that the indirect aid is not granted, that there are no free of charge services given to certain undertakings, giving selective advantage only to uh, a certain categories of companies, then indirect aid would not, uh, not be there. So hence, in the assessment phase of the project, quality assessment, uh, a stated assessment will show if there is risk of indirect aid, whether indirect aid should be granted or there is a possibility to remove aid with measures such as making all the materials available online, uh, whether this is in English language or uh, uh, any of the national languages and so on. Thank you, Christina. As a, as a communications person, I find state aid very fascinating because every single word seems to have a very specific definition and there's no freedom to try to understand it your own way. So you really have to read into the issues, really understand what every single term means in order to get this right. So um, very interesting. Uh, coming back to indirect uh, state aid. Uh, in case of indirect state aid, how is it calculated the 20,000 euro threshold? Is there an already existing methodology approved by the joint secretariat? Um, just a, a brief explanation. This 20,000 euros is the maximum, for example, uh, value of the free of charge services provided to undertakings final beneficiaries of all project activities. And it comes from GIBR regulation. Uh, indeed, on uh, our side of the program, we recommend that for determining the amount of aid free of charge services, uh, uh, the method to be used is uh, to find comparable market price. Uh, so for, for example, if the project is providing consulting services to certain companies, that they, uh, before this activity start, come to us and provide us with the estimation of the aid based on the calculation, market research, how they found, how they determined this price. In case we are talking about very specific services given free of charge to companies with, throughout the project and that no re re uh, reliable benchmark on market exists. Then also other methods can be used, which is to uh, uh, share the cost, uh, estimated cost for the implementation of such activities with the number of undertakings receiving this selective advantage. Of course, this methodology uh, is available to already for uh, project which are approved in the call one, so they are aware how this uh, indirect aid, value of indirect aid to be granted under GIVR Article 20A by partners is to be estimated. Thank you, Christina. I have one more question for you, and then we will bring back Helga for the blockbuster questions, mm -hmm. really upvoted much on budget development. So the final question for now, on state aid is the amount of state aid granted to final beneficiaries ha has to be determined in which way? So uh, coming back to the pr previous question as well, by providing us market research showing what is the price of such services which are falling under indirect aid on the market. So we're talking about free of charge services such as training, advisory services, con uh, consultancy, um, and so on. When the project partner is implementing such activity affected with indirect aid, they have to before um, implementing of the activity and once the undertaking the company which is receiving free of charge service is recognized, they need to provide us with the estimation of the aid, what is the value of this free of charge service based on the market research, what is the comparable price of such services on the market. If this doesn't exist, then they would have to take into account cost plan for such activity. And the MAJS has to have give approval of estimation of indirect aid to uh, partners concerned. Thank you very much, Christina. I'm sure there will be more questions now trickling in. So let's see. Um, but for now, I would like to welcome back Helga. Hi, Helga. Hi, Are you Helga. ready? I'm ready. <laughs> so we have a little more than half an hour to go. I saw that there is also questions on thematic scope coming in. We uh, will also take those uh, in order to give you another break. But let's stick to the topic of this round and go back to finance topics. 
is there a limit on the different budget category categories if reported as actual costs? Can staff costs uh, be minimal and the equipment and work infrastructures costs be a bigger part? Okay, so again, uh, going to the to the topic on how to build the budgets. As I mentioned previously, budgets should always be built in a realistic manner. So uh, one has to see how what what the activities are and how uh, it is for each cost category. And from a program perspective, there is no limitation on how much can there be, for example, for staff costs or for external expertise. And we always recommend, as I said before, that the budget should always reflect the activities and how these will be carried out. So no, there are no limitations as such. Thank you. What type of activities can be outsourced to external subcontractors under external expertise and services costs? Um, mentioning again, I, I always go back to mentioning the, the manual and the program manual because it really uh, provides all the definitions for uh, for what, uh, with regards to the financial part, there are all the definitions for each cost category, what is uh, included under each cost category and the definitions. So when it comes, for example, to external expertise, there is quite a long list of what uh, can be funded under external expertise. And this includes, for example, I don't know, surveys and, um, I mean, costs that are needed for the project that are eligible. And then if they cannot be done from uh, by the by the own staff, then they can be subcontracted. But as I mentioned, there is a whole list. I think there are about 12 to 13 bullet points on what is eligible under um, the cost category for which is external expertise and services. Thank you. Staff recruited through temporary agencies. Um, can these be this kind of stuff be uh, included under the budget line stuff? This is a bit of a, in a way, a tricky question, but uh, we have to uh, keep in mind that the definition of staff costs is uh, related to staff which are directly uh, employed by the beneficiary. However, there is also a, a kind of an exception of certain uh, natural persons uh, that are recruited in a different way other than having a, a, a labor contract, an employment contract, but can be for, but can be seen as own staff. And there are um, certain requirements that have to be fulfilled. All the requirements have to be fulfilled. With regard to the agency, it is a bit tricky because in, it, this is usually a, a contract that you have with the agency and it is more seen as uh, external services. But I really would like to um, point out that it is very important for some specific uh, issues to always speak to the national controllers and see their opinion, because there are sometimes even um, certain exceptions in the labor law itself, how to see whether something is uh, how it is uh, the, this this staff is defined. So it's it's important to also contact the national controllers and before starting the project, speak to them and ask whether things are fine if included under a specific cost category. Thank you. We have a question from Italy. How small can you go as a partner? So if you're a small nonprofit organization, uh, are there any kind of minimal financial capacity requirements you need to meet? Well, of course, as I mentioned, you need to have the financial capacity to actually pre-finance your activities uh, and, and then you will get be reimbursed later. So even when uh, read well, also the declaration, you need to, to sign a declaration uh, where it shows that you are uh, not in the red, basically, so that you have enough um, resources to, to be able to pre-finance the project. And uh, another thing, then it also depends whether you are a lead partner, lead applicant, 
or a project partner, because in the case of a lead applicants that is, for example, private, then uh, there are some, there is a financial capacity uh, check that is performed uh, during the formal and administrative um, compliance check. And I guess the national contact points can also help in answering uh, such a question a lot, Helga. Sure. And this is also, you know, like the, it's at national level, they also do the, the legal status and capacity check. So if you need to have the capacity to implement the project. Of course, that's crucial. Um, we want to see the results. So you have to have the capacity. Um, one more question for you, and then we will mm -hmm. go back to the first round and answer, take a few questions, maybe on thematic scope, Helga. So last uh, one for the time being, can also participants outside the uh, Central Europe uh, cooperation area participate in a consortium? If yes, are there any requirements and budget constraints? This was partially answered by Luca already right at the beginning, but maybe just to remind. Exactly, but I think I, I know where this um, partial constraints is coming from mm -hmm. before, because in the in the previous programming period, there was a certain amount of percentage that could have been uh, devoted to these uh, partners coming from outside Central Europe. And this used to be 20%. But for this programming period, there is no such threshold of how much can be uh, allocated to these partners that are from EU member states, but outside uh, our program area. So um, there are no budget constraints there. But of course, there are requirements that in order, and Luca already mentioned, why these such partners can be included and when they can in, be included in a partnership. Thank you, Helga. We, I, I see there's still 40 questions and more. Um, not all of them are finance, Helga. Just I can give you a short break. Uh, we will anyways, unfortunately, not manage all of these questions. So already a big sorry. Um, we have the help desk, help desk at interact-central.eu or so. If today we will not manage to answer all of your questions. So for now, I would like to come back to um, specific objective 2.3. That's Miliana. Hello, Miliana. Hi, Frank. Thanks. Good to see you again also in the third round. It wasn't planned, but let's give Helga a break and let's answer all yes, the thematic uh, uh, scope questions flexibly. Thanks for uh, coming back. Uh, two projects concerning, there's a project concerning defining changes in consumer protection policies on the national and regional level um, fit this specific objective. So okay. when you work on consumer protection yes. policies, um, are you relevant? <laughs> yes, let's say first of all that 2.3 concentrates on cooperation to increase the deployment of circular economy approaches, including waste management. And uh, one of the challenges is behavioral change of producers, consumers, and public buyers. How this topic of consumer protection fits circular economy in this uh, sense, um, I would advise then to really describe more idea in uh, our portal and then to apply for the, for the consultations. Because just from the short uh, one sentence that we here see, we don't see on what kind of a protection we are in which topic, let's say, like this. So please put more information in Project IDEA on our page and uh, we will come back to you to have the uh, appointment with us. Yes, and book the appointment early on because yes. Diana and her <laughs> colleagues will not have endless slots for discussing our social yeah. economy as much as we would love to and as much as we are interested in what you're planning to do uh, we only have these uh, few weeks uh, to really set meetings um, over Easter until and, and then all of April until the 10th of May. Um, thank you, Mirjana. I have more of a general question. Um, but yeah, let's see who we bring in. Um, is the consultation of a project mandatory? And um, who should be 
consulted in specific in, in priority two. Since priority two uh, is mentioned, maybe Lubor, uh, I can ask you to answer this, but still, nevertheless, rather general question whether a consultation is mandatory or not. Lubor. Maybe a little bit too spontaneous. If Lubor is not with us, maybe uh, Luca, you can take this over. Uh, can you repeat the question, please? Yes, thank you, Luca, um, for being available for the, answering this. Basically, the question is, do uh, project lead applicants have to ask for a consultation? Is it uh, mandatory or is it voluntary? Uh, no, it's not mandatory. This is a service we are offering to, uh, to lead applicants. But if somebody is feeling very secure on their own ideas and or they are experienced or maybe it's resubmission, whatever. I mean, this is absolutely up to, to the to the lead partner to decide. And for us, it's also totally fine if somebody doesn't come. Um, and then to whom, of course, this depends. This is to be done through the, the community platform. And then we will sort internally how and who and when this consultation is happening. Absolutely, thank you, Luca. We always have a um, have at least two experts uh, being uh, available to answer uh, your questions in an individual consultation. So um, sometimes even more, but uh, as I said, capacities are limited, and it's it's a service, it's not a must, as Luca said. So thank you, Luca, for jumping in and answering this question. But I understand for the next question, I can bring Lubor in. Lubor, are you there? Hello. Sorry, hello. Uh, good morning, still good morning for also from my side. Uh, thank you for coming to me. And of course, I'm also happy to hear that there is also a thematic question related to the uh, specific objective 2.2. Yeah, maybe let me let me read this out uh, briefly, Luber, mm -hmm. so that we are all on the same picture. Thank you for joining. Um, so is a project that focuses on the increasing resistance for extreme weather events in the mountain catchment areas um, by creating a pilot warning system for the population based on an integrated flood protection system suitable for this program. Almost sounds like a very concrete um, project idea. So uh, a few more sentences on this, um, another half pager, and Jegor and, uh, Sienkiewicz uh, will be ready for a consultation already, if you ask me. Of course, it really looks like already quite a... Uh, right project idea or already developed project idea that would be a very good subject for a consultation that I would definitely recommend you to have as soon as possible because it already seems that you have a concrete idea in your head and hopefully also or maybe already also the composition of the partnership. At this point, I would recommend you also to have a look again at the description of the um, specific objective 2.2 in uh, IP and program IP and also uh, description of uh, transnational activities that are already uh, presented there, where you can also, among others, find a reference to the resilience to extreme weathers and related uh, hazards. So I guess this also answers my question. And maybe another point that I would like to highlight, please also have a look at already what has been approved in the first call, because actually there are already some projects that are during with forecasting. So in order not to reinvent the wheel, but rather to function complementary to what the others are already doing. But this would be, I guess, uh, better to discuss in details during um, our individual consultation that I'm looking forward to. Thank you. Thank you, Lubar. And indeed, uh, it's always good uh, to look into what we are financing already after the first call. We have 53 uh, funded projects already that are currently kicking off. Um, you will find some initial information on the website already. We will extend the information. We will publish a list of the partners in these projects uh, very soon in the coming uh, weeks, uh, shortly after Easter. So you will also see in, um, not only in which regions these projects are working, but also gain some information on who exactly is doing what 
um, if you see an interesting acronym, it is also very likely that you find something published on the partners' websites already on uh, what these projects are working on. So thank you very much, Luber, for this. And with um, with that, I think we can come back to finance in the next step. Let's have a look into a question there. Hi, Helga. Um, a few more questions. I hear that uh, many questions are very similar to what you answered already. So um, I think we um, do not have to take all the 41 questions that are remaining. Uh, let's try to identify those that are really new, where we have some new information. Um, and let's have a look at a first question very soon. State aid I haven't seen. Yes. I think there were quite a number of questions, Frank, related to investments and, and infrastructure and so on. Yeah. And I really, here again, I mean, would like to, I know I'm repeating myself, but the program manual really gives a lot of information of what is to be regarded as investments when it's it's um, it's uh, has to be described in the application form and so on and so forth. So I really, because I've seen that there are quite a number of, of these questions also relating to ownership of the investment. Again, there is specific information about uh, that the partner need to own uh, where, where, uh, the land and building where works will be carried out, must be owned by the beneficiary. And if not, they need to set in place long-term legally binding arrangements to fulfill the requirements related to durability and maintenance. Mm -hmm. So maybe I answered in 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 I tried to answer many that I've seen about investments yeah. in 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 a short uh, while. And I think such questions could also be raised in the individual consultations, especially I think because sometimes these are probably very specific and uh, and investments are indeed. Uh, I mean, I think Monica uh, really emphasized we are not an investment program. We are talking about rather small. Uh, pilot investments here, but nevertheless, they are really crucial to test. So uh, probably the consultations are also a good um, occasion to um, further discuss such questions. I have a question by Gabriela uh, once more here on the um, financing of digital platform development. So can the development of a digital platform uh, be um, considered eligible? And if so, under which cost category? Okay, then it also depends what are the, the type of costs. So here we say that if it is, for example, IT hardware and software itself, then it would be under the cost category five, which is equipment. If uh, the, the the development is subcontracted to um, to to an expert, then it would be under the cost category four, which is external expertise and services. Whilst if it is developed internally by your own staff, the costs will be under uh, the cost category one, which is staff costs. Thank you, Helga. We are coming slowly towards the end of this uh, webinar, and I can tell we are trying to identify the new questions, so we are jumping a little bit. The next question we believe um, we should probably uh, take uh, from the work plan. So no more finance questions, maybe. So for the work plan, I think we can ask uh, Christoph to come back. And hello, Christoph. Hello, so we have a question. Um, so how do you measure the uptake of outputs? I think we are back to uh, probably sustainability issues here. So a very interesting question, I find. Yeah, I think, uh, first of all, I'd like to join the feedback Helga was giving. Uh, please have a look at the manual. I think this is really the program manual. There is everything is in there. And there is one chart which is in there, which shows the logic we have between outputs being produced, the covered by the respective output indicators, and to be covered then by the related result indicators. And this is exactly the place, these result indicators, where the uptake of your outputs is being measured. For the definition of the result indicators, 
but also of the output indicators, please also have a look at the annex number two to the program manual, where you have the very concrete specification of what is meant in terms of uptake. Um, for example, the uptake can be uh, of a strategy, can be the adoption by a council decision, it can be by a letter of commitment, it can be a letter of intent, it can be different things, um, but it depends on the product you are thinking of, and then have a look at the definition which is included in this Annex 2, which as said also includes some examples. And then, uh, since Frank, you were relating to the durability, um, yes, durability is key. When you develop a proposal, don't only think about uh, how can we conduct our activities in these two and a half years, um, but think about how can we have a lasting change in the territories. And for this, you need to have an uptake um, or a mainstreaming or a rollout in the respective territory. And this should be also coming out of your proposal in order to have a winning proposal. Thank you very much, Christoph. Um, we also put the link to the uh, online version of the program menu now into Slido. You can easily search uh, this version, this online version, and find all the answers, hopefully, or many answers. Uh, if you have any uh, specific questions, again, let me emphasize we have the help desk. Um, we have uh, the consultations coming up. Uh, I hear from my colleagues here that many of the questions that are still left are either touching on similar issues as we had them or they are very specific. So it's uh, very uh, difficult to answer them now here in this rather general webinar. So I would propose a last question for you, Christoph. You will have the honor now to close this uh, webinar. So uh, last question for you, and then we can uh, break uh, uh, up and uh, conclude this webinar a few minutes earlier. So um, people have more time to actually browse through the program manual and our support measures. So let's have a look into the last question for today, maybe Christoph. And I'm curious what is coming our way. So, can project implementation core activities, for example, develop the development of a digital platform that serves the integral part of the project, be outsourced to subcontractors? Or should these activities be implemented by a consortium partner? So, Gabriela clearly wants to do a digital platform, I think. And um, so, it's, it's, it's not fully fully clear how to, how to deal with this. Christoph. Yeah. Um, similar to my responses uh, to previous questions, I'm always coming back to the intervention logic um, because we are seeing often projects developing um, digital platforms. But then always the question is, do these platforms really lead to a territorial change and an improvement of the situation in the respective territories? Is there a clear strategy of whom is going to use this digital platform? not only during the project, but also beyond. So are you creating a product which is going to last and have a lasting effect in the territories? And how, how will it be sustained? I think these are the crucial questions which you have to ask yourself if you really want to develop such a digital platform. Whether then the programming is done by subcontractors or whether you have uh, a, a partner on board who is able to do this with its own stuff doesn't make so much the difference because it's about um, what you want to achieve with your project. And the achievement of your project cannot or should not be the creation of a platform. You want to initiate a change. So if you want to have this digital platform being used by some uh, public authorities, you should have the public authorities on board who can commit to continue to use it. This is more important than to think about who will be the do the coding of this platform. So it's really thinking about the lasting effects, how to create the change in the territories, um, because the goal of uh, the Interact Central Euro program is to improve uh, the living conditions in cities and regions across Central Europe, and transnational cooperation is. Uh, the tool which we are using and which we're making available in order to support the sustainable development in Central Europe. Thank you, Christoph. Thank you very much. 
the whole talking about digital platforms, um, we found a question which I find interesting. So um, we uh, will also answer this one. And, and this question is about finding partners, building a partnership. And I think I can take this myself. So thank you very much, Christoph, for the time being. Um, so the last question I would like to answer, it's actually now uh, on me. Do, we do have a project, but we need to find uh, the European partnership to develop it. How can we find partners? Uh, talking about digital platform, we, two years ago, before we launched the first call, we developed this platform that you are now watching and following this uh, webinar on. And I think it's really important to understand this is not only an event platform. You will be able to find partners here. You will be able to set meetings with partners. You will be able to browse through project ideas. You can publish your own project idea, not only if you want an individual consultation, but also if you want to find partners. So uh, I think the best starting point maybe is to uh, get in touch with your thematic networks, use your personal networks. And if you're not successful finding partners there and you want to really broaden the scope of your partnership, find relevant partners in specific countries that you have no, that you're not in touch with yet, then this community that you're on right now is the place where to put your project idea, specify from which country, what kind of partner with what kind of expertise you're looking for. And hopefully, we have heard at least that it works, um, you will find the relevant partners to build a really relevant project partnership in terms of what already Christoph and Monica were mentioning earlier this morning. I would like to come to an end now. I would like to thank, first of all, all members of the JS team who were supporting uh, this event, who are my colleagues who were sharing their knowledge and expertise. Maybe I can ask you to very briefly switch on your cameras and wave a goodbye so that you see how many experts we actually had in the background uh, waiting for your questions. Most of them you have seen. Winfried, unfortunately, there were no questions on mobility and transport. Either it's because it's a smaller group or they really are experts already working with us. We will find out in the individual consultations that you will be running. Um, thank you very much to you all. Um, since you will not see the audience, I will wave you a big uh, thank you. And thank you very much for participating. See you later. Um, and I would also like to thank my colleagues, uh, which you don't see, that have been very uh, helpful in running this webinar. I hope we covered most of your questions. So thank you very much also for supporting this webinar. Um, last message, Christoph already was making uh, many good points uh, about uh, reading the program manual, getting really familiar with what we are doing. Again, I think a good starting point, if you still have questions, um, is also to watch the tutorials. It's not only thematic tutorials that we have there. We also have some technical tutorials on the intervention logic, on project budget development. And what you hear there, very often, I think you can find the answer then in the program manual, which is quite comprehensive. But at the same time, we try to keep it short. If questions remain, again, big reminder, book your consultation early on. We will open the slots as of tomorrow here on this community again. You will find a new um, menu point on consultations. You just go there, you request a consultation, you will get an expert from the JS assigned, and then you get 45 minutes to discuss your idea, not your project proposal, as Luca was saying, it's not a pre-proposal check, but your project idea, you can discuss in further detail then with our experts on thematic questions in thematic uh, regard, but also budget questions will be covered there. And last but not least, obviously also communication questions. So I think with this, we are coming to an end. Thank you very much once more for attending this webinar, and I wish you all the best in developing your project proposals. Thank you. Goodbye. <laughs>